Okay, so welcome everybody to the uh, extremely exciting second week on elliptic curve cryptography. So what we did last week, even though it, it, it seemed like a lot of material, what we, what, what we really de did, we essentially introduced one more cyclic group and we mainly talked about this elliptic, gru um, elliptic curve group operation. So what, what we want to do today is we want to um, essentially do two things and you know each of these things are a little bit more complicated because elliptic curves are complicated. We want to talk about elliptic curve diffy, uh, discrete logarithm problem which I think is a pretty cool idea and then we want to put things a little bit um, into practice and demonstrate a little bit what we can do with elliptic curve and we, we picked the sim most simple protocol which is elliptic curve diffie hellman Okay, so two things, discrete logarithm problem, diffie hellman what is nice about this whole stuff, as you saw, elliptic curves are pretty complicated. What I like about today's lecture, we essentially do the same thing we did over the last four weeks or so, namely talk about discrete logarithm problem, but with a different structure here. So we kind of we combine this new weird things, elliptic curves, with something we did before with respect to the discrete logarithm problem, you know, one-way functions and stuff. And um, secondly, Again, we take this new complicated stuff and somehow relates it to Diffie-Hellman. And what I hope is also that you get a better understanding what is the discrete logarithm problem, what is Diffie-Hellman really. Okay, so I think from a pedagogical point of view, this is hopefully a useful thing that we're doing today. Okay. So, first chapter of today is... Again, EC by itself stands for elliptic curve, and if it's ECC, it's elliptic curve cryptography. So this is elliptic curve discrete log logarithm problem. So what we showed what we showed is if you consider in our certain type of equation in uh, over the real numbers we get this type of of curve and then what we did uh, this kind of repetition from last week and then given two points P and Q we came up with this weird thing doing addition and this is you know what, what you suffered through last night when you started working on your homework right you know we did group addition P plus Q so um, and now and I, I, um, we ended last week at the end saying they form a cyclic group. Okay, and that was just a theorem, and you, you did your homework, but I, I want to do that together with you uh, one more time to put a little bit life into that whole thing. By looking at an example. You know, I, I really want to look, is, is this really a cyclic group for one specific example? Okay, we look at an... Um, Example, elliptic curve as a cyclic group. And again, in your lecture notes, this should be immediately under where, where we stopped last Wednesday. Okay, you know, because the last theorem was under certain conditions, elliptic curves form a cyclic group. And now we look at an elliptic curve that actually is a cyclic group, the, the points of which are, an ellipt are a cyclic group. So... Um, very often in literature, you just give a name to this equation. It's, it's typically called E for elliptic curves. So the curve we're looking at is, is exactly the one that we're using in our textbook all the time. It's y square is equivalent to xq plus ax plus b, and a has a value 2. So xq plus 2x plus 12 
and the, the modulus, the prime that we consider is 17, okay? And now comes an important remark for this specific curve. All points form a cyclic group. which is not always the case, but this is an easy case here you know, from, from a teaching point of view. That's why we picked that curve. Um, so, and now we want to really look at the, um, at the cyclic group. I said last week, what is the requirement for cyclic groups? A very, very simple requirement. What kind of thing do we, do, do we need to have for a cyclic group? I'm not continuing until I hear an answer. What's that? Ein Generator, Ein Generator genau, a generator. So, and this generator, another word for generator is primitive element. The primitive element is, for instance, there are a whole bunch of primitive elements, but we look at this primitive element, P equals to 5,1. So the x coordinate is 5, y coordinate is 1. Okay? What is a generator? What is a primitive element? If you take the, <coughs> the powers or the multiples in an additive group, if, if you keep adding P to itself, you generate the entire group. <coughs> and what we also did last week, um, actually for this specific point and uh, curve, we computed 2P, which is you know, P plus P, and it turned out... So this is last night, right? 11 p.m., right, 23 Uhr, when you did your homework, right, this, this is this stuff here, so this is this complicated formulas, right, with the S, the slope, and so forth, so this is, turns out, and have the dots here, so this is not non-trivial, right, this, you know, if you do the pocket calculator, it takes you, whatever, five minutes to do that, um, then we can do 3P, which is 2P plus P, P added to again, and again, you know, five minutes pocket calculator, and you end up, oh, ah, my, my mistake here, this is 6,3, and the next point is 10,6, and so forth, okay, and we're not doing all of that here, obviously, and then at some point, we, add, we hit um, 18p, which has this coordinate, okay? And one thing, you know, if you look at it, what happens is you see this x-coordinate and this x-coordinate are the same. And there's actually more happening, namely... Did anyone know how the 16 and the 1s are related here? Yeah. Inverse. They're the inverse uh. modulus 17, right? With the, with, you know, with, the, with the coordinates itself, we do this modulo p arithmetic. So this is the same as 5, comma minus 1. You know, you take minus 1, you add 17, you end up with 16, right? This is in 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 Z seventeen, right? In Z seventeen. So, but this is the condition. So, what is this equal now to? If you compare those two here, does anyone know what is this here now? This is ma yeah. Yes, exactly. This is minus. This is minus p. Good that I force you to do homework, right? I mean, I can tell you there's no way anybody would remember that we did that 168 hours ago, right? 166 hours ago, last Wednesday, if you hadn't done the homework yesterday or whatever, or five days ago. Very good. Super. So, and just... 
tiny, tiny reminder. I, I, uh, uh, um, I mentioned that there, there are two minuses here in this expression, right? There's this minus, which is the minus with respect to modulo 2, and there's this minus with respect to group operation, and they're completely different beasts, okay? Compl they, they mean something completely different. They both look like, you know, innocent little bars. They're something completely different. They essentially have nothing in common, just to stress that. So, coming back to our cyclic group stuff, so we, we've seen 18p is the same as the inverse of p. So, now let's continue this, this, this cyclic thing, you know, let's continue adding p to itself. So the next would be 19p. So how do we arrive 19p? Well, obviously we take 18p and we add the point one more time. Okay. And now you have to be careful and you have to, in this coordinate system, you really have to manually check that you can't use the group, op the, the group equation at this point. Okay, so you, what, what you really have to do before you do the group operation, you have to check whether the two points that you're adding I'm sorry, it's too early here for me. 5 and 16 plus 5 and 1 you have to check whether the y-coordinates are the inverses of each other, modulo p. And they are, and in this case, what is the result? Any ideas? Neutralis element, exactly, the neutral element. Okay which doesn't have coordinates. You don't have to use your pocket calculator to do anything funny here, right? If, as soon as you see that, you know, the you know, inverse of a point plus the point itself is point of infinity. You can't really do arithmetic arithmetic. It has to do with the fact that this is this imaginary, imaginary point. You know, it's not, it doesn't have real coordinates. Okay, so this is 19p. So what, what's going to happen now? We want to continue the next, we want to compute the next point, 20p. What is that? Well, 19p, we've just seen, is the point of infinity plus p. And it was really good, n nobody said point of infinity, you said neutral element. And this is exactly what happens here. Neutral element plus p is p again, right? So 20p is equal to p. Twenty one p is, of course, 20p plus p, but 20p we've just seen is, is equal to the point itself. So this is 2p. You get the idea, right? I do one more. 22 times p is 21 plus p. This is 3. Probably, I probably made a mistake. Yeah, yeah. I might have. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I made him you see that there it's plus two. The elliptic curve equation is wrong. Get rid of that one. Very good. So what is this big thing that I want want to bring across the big Lern effect here is after 19 p's, number, I'm back, back to the beginning, I'm back to p again, right? Tw tw 20 times p is equal to p, 21 is 2p and so forth, so I'm starting cycling around, which is this very property of a cyclic group, right? I wanted to show you that here, okay? What I really, können wir leise sein, auch da billige Plätze, ja? What I really like about that is that this is so different than looking at cyclic group with integers. You know, looking at integers and saying, well, this is some kind of odd behavior with integer and modular arithmetic. Here, we have this completely pathological, you know, krankhafte group operation, right? This really odd thing, you know, doing arithmetic on elliptic curves, adding points, and suddenly we get exactly the same behavior we observe with integers. And sometimes if you generalize things, you get a deeper insight. You know, and I hope this happens. Maybe with the next homework assignment, but it's, I, I, I like that. I think it's, it's, it's very cool to do. Okay, so again, you see this starts cycling around here. Um, what we really want to do in crypto, why, why, why do we do that? We're not that fascinating with, you know, groups with some kind of cyclic structure per se, we want to do something with that, namely we want to build crypto systems, okay? And in particular, we can build crypto systems by looking at certain type of problems. And in this case, with, with, with cyclic group, we build DL problems, discrete logarithm problems, and that's what I want to do now. We obtain immediately a discrete logarithm problem, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to show that um, the pages from our textbook, which is definition 9.2.1, on page something rather. Okay, okay so this is what I want to you know, briefly talk about and it's, it's almost the same we had before about discrete logarithm problems. So, the algebraic structure, that means the, the, the set where we do arithmetics that we consider is not mod p, but this is, of course, an elliptic curve, right? So, so we look at an elliptic curve, we look at a primitive element. Why is there a primitive element? Because discrete logarithm problems, you know, live in cyclic groups, so there must be a, a primitive element. And another element t, right, which is called here, right? And remember, what, 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 what is the property of a cyclic group? If you have a generator, if you have a primitive element, this primitive element, of course, generates all possible po all points, all existing points, including, obviously, the point T here, okay? So <clears throat> that means this point T can, in fact, be expressed as a multiple of the primitive element, right? You do P plus P plus P plus P a certain number of times, you know, and this is a hard thing to figure out, and here we call it d times, you know, and then if, if you add p d times, you know, d is, I don't know, 5 or 7 or some 256-bit number, it's equal to t, okay? And the dis discrete logarithm problem is, the discrete logarithm problem is, given p, given t, you know, given this, the first point, given the other point, what is the small parameter d, which has an extremely nice graphical 
interpretation of the discrete logarithm problem much, much nicer than modulo p. Okay. Which all the books don't tell you, but I, I do. Okay. So a graphical interpretation, and it, it's not very deep, of the discrete logarithm problem is... Um, You know, if, if this is our generator, P, kind of our starting point, okay? And now what we do, we start hopping around, ne, springen, on the elliptic curve. That means we do the group operation, right? We do P plus, for instance, P plus P, and we end, I don't know what, that would be here, would maybe be 2p, and then you do the group operation again, and you would end up perhaps here, you get 3p, and you get 4p, and 5p, and so forth. You, you, you keep doing that, right? And at some point, you stop, and you get some final point maybe here. Okay, t. How did you get there? Well, you hop many, 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 many times on the curve, right? And now the discrete logarithm problem is the following. Everybody awake? It's, it's, it's 10 seconds, 10 seconds. I give you the starting point, the primitive element. I give you the final point, which is the public key. And you tell me how often did I hop on the curve. The number of hops is what, what, what is the number of hops? In cryptographic terms, this is the, it's a private key. The number of hops, so the number of group operations that are executed, this D, right, D times, the lowercase d, is the secret key. And this is a hard thing. If I give you the start point and the final point, it's really hard to tell how often I hopped around in order to compute that. Okay? Again, none of the books tell you this graphically. Okay. Back to sleep. So looking at this definition here, we can maybe look at the example. Example for the discrete logarithm problem. Let's say the starting point at in, in this, in this uh, elliptic curve we looked at before is this primitive element. Now I give you one of the points, one of these 19 points that are being generated, namely the point T, right? What we do know, what we do know is, since this is since p is a generator, we know that this is possible, right? This is possible, meaning there exists a d, there exists an integer d, so that this that that, that, that this point can be written as a multiple of p, you know, multiple addition. The question is, what is d here, right? It means in, in, in other terms here, just to put a little bit life into that. What is d? Can anybody tell me what d is here? It's not 19. Nine, because 19... You know, 19 times p was the point of infinity, and this is not the point of infinity here. This is hard to do. You can't do it with, even with a small example. You cannot, you cannot do that. You, you can look in the book. And, or we actually we look, you know, it's, we, we look at this example. We just... Here. So we, here, you know, you have to look at, at, at this table that, that, that's uh, uh, from the book. If you look at this, can anybody tell me what um, D is? What the private key is here? 
we have to look, uh, yeah, the C13P, right? So, from the textbook, we conclude that B is equal to, what did I say, 13, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> yeah, another mistake, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But very good, sehr gut aufgepasst, danke. Of course, in a P is this primitive element here. So, um, so let's stay. Let's stick a little bit more with this. Uh, um, with this definition, I, I, I blow that up again. Okay. So what is very important here from this definition? You know, again, we 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 looked at it. We we saw that the First, we have this primitive element, which is kind of a little bit boring. Then, but what is interesting is that we have to look at the two type of keys that we have, okay? Namely, note about elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem ECDLP is that D. Is a private key, and again, D is the number of hops on the curve, and this is <coughs> the data type. What, what, what kind of thing is D? Is that a complex number, or a differential equation, or a matrix, or a rational number, or it's an integer, the number of hops. It's wie oft ich gesprungen bin. This is an integer. This is nothing weird. Okay, so this. Is an integer, okay? Very well behaved, and this is true for all for all discrete logarithm problems. It's always an integer, no matter what curve, uh, what what group you're you're working with. Not so. How did I call the T? Right. This uppercase T is a public key. And what kind of thing is that? What kind of algebraic structure? What kind of data type, if you're more in, in computer science? What's it? Two integers in this case. In general, this is a point. This is, is point. On curve, IE, das heißt, a group element. And this is always true. For all discrete logarithm problems, the public key is whatever weird thing you're using. Okay, this is elliptic curve, so you think this is strange, they are stranger things. Okay, there's algebraic varieties, there are hyperelliptic curves. So the even wilder type of discrete logarithm problems, generalizations of elliptic curves, the public key is whatever weird thing you, you're working with, okay? Not so, the, uh, that means the public key here. Not so the private key, the private key is always so the number of hops, if you wish, the number of, of, of group operations. This is always a well-behaved integer. So this is always elementary school, right? This is Grundschule here, you know? This is, you start to count, right? You know, three teddy bears, right? You know, how many circles are, you know what I'm saying? So this is, this is always, this is not, nothing strange. This is very often strange, okay? 
Okay, so now we have to stick with this weirdness for a little bit longer. Um, so one question maybe is um, that game, yeah. Deseli, what is very important if you do discrete logarithm problems in practice, what is very important, one question that you need to answer, and this has to do with attacks, for certain attacks, it's very important to know how many elements are in the group, the group cardinality, okay? So, Group cardinality, which is a really fancy way of saying how many points are in my cyclic group, right? This is what we, it's also called the order, order of the group. I like group cardinality a little bit better. Um, what is the group cardinality? How many points are on the curve? Okay. Maybe let's look, let's go back to this example first. You know, we looked at this specific elliptic curves and we kept adding. This is the example we did. Can anybody telling, tell me from looking at the blackboard, you can actually, you can see that, how many points are in this cyclic group here yeah, that we're looking at? 19, very good. Be careful, that it, it, you're absolutely 100% right. They're like 18 actual points, real points, you know, P2, P3, P, blah, blah, up to 18 P with actual coordinates. And point number 19 is, point of infinity, but this counts, right? This is this neutral element, of course, is part of the group, okay? So for this specific group, we have a group cardinality, and there's a special symbol for that. I'm going to introduce that in this, mo this second. This is, okay, you know, this doppelkreuz, it's is number of Anzahl, right? Number of E is, is 19, okay? So this is, was an example here, okay? So in general, for general elliptic curves, what is the, what are the number of points? And there is a, a very useful theorem by, I believe, a German mathematician Just went over this. Which is Hasse, okay? Hasse theorem or Hasse bound or Hasse Schranke, right, in German, Hasse Schranke, which tells us, if you look at an elliptic curve, and this is the case modulo P, you can also do that over general finite fields, but if you do that modulo P, this number here, right, means the number of points is bound, is eingeschränkt. On the lower hand, it's essentially P. You know, you have P here, you have P there, plus, if you wish, some correction term, okay? Namely, the, you know, 1 minus Wurzel, Wurzel P, and uh, here you have, or essentially here, you know, minus 2 times square root of P, plus two times square root of p here, okay? So, and this gives you bound, schranken an, okay? So, has the theorem, gives us a lower and upper bound for E, okay, and this is, what, what is that, uh, compare theorem 9.2.2 from the textbook, um,
what um, in, in very engineering-ish, very rough terms, what this tells us, very rough approximation, heißt an Annäherung, Schätzung, Näherung, Approximation, You know, continue underneath here is number of point is roughly, very, very roughly P. Okay. If I see critical faces in this room, this is great because if you look at this expression here, it doesn't seem that E is that close to P. There seem to be all the square roots going on, blah, 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 blah. But what, what, what we're really seeing up there, what, what this is really, what this is, what the Hasse point really says is E is in the range of P plus 1 which is P, you know, this plus one, we, 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 don't, we, we don't worry too much about it, plus minus square root of P, okay? So what this really tells us, a number of, of points is the prime itself, and then plus minus, we go in, in, in direction of two times the square root, okay? Square root still look big, looks big, and can be, a, in, in absolute terms, this is a huge number, also the absolute wert is, is gigantic. The relative value relatively to P is small. To give you an idea, what is popular is um, P, for instance, is a 160-bit number. And I'm going to talk more about 160 bits in a minute. How many bits are in P here, in, in square root P? Wurzel aus P, yep. 80 bits. If you take the square root of a number, you have the number of bits, so that means Okay. So what's, you know, and, and, and then factor of two, what happens with the bit length if you, if you multiply a number by two? By one bit, right? You double, so it's. So this is 81 bits now, okay? This is. Okay. So what Hassel's bound tells us is very engineering ish, you know, second semester. We have a 160 bit number, and the maximum we do, we is the maximum derivation, abweichung of this p value is. You add or subtract 80 bits, that means you add or subtract something here, kind of in the lower half, okay? To put things in, into perspective, this is the same. You do Wevert Millionaire, right? You win this one million, and the correction factor is square root of one million. What is the square root of one million? <coughs> Thousand, right? So. You win one million, and this is plus minus 1,000. If you win one million euros, it's essentially you don't care whether you will win one million, 1,000, or what is it, 999,000 nine, nine euros. Everybody with me? This correction term of square root P is pretty small. In absolute terms, the absolute wert is gigantic. I mean, the absolute value is 2 to the 80 at some... Huge, huge, huge number relatively to a 160-bit number is not that huge, okay? So this, why this is not such a bad approximation. So, but things are actually not that pretty they're, they're, um, as it's, um, as I make it use, as, make it, as, as I made it sound here, okay? In, in reality, things are a little bit more difficult because um, in practice, Um, one needs the exact 
number of points in order to thwart Abwehren, probably is wahrscheinlich ein neues Wort für manchmal. Thwart is abwehren. To thwart um, certain attacks. Okay. It means it's great that, has, uh, that, that the Hasselbound gives us a rough idea, which is very important. You know, we, we want to know how big the, this algebraic structure, how big the discrete logarithm problem is for some attacks, you know, you need a minimum size, for instance, to protect against brute force attacks and square root attacks. But for other attacks, we have to look, we have to know exactly how big the um, uh, um, elliptic, uh, 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 um, what the cardinality is. We, we, we need to know that exactly. And Hass's bone doesn't give that, give, give, give that to us. Hass's bone only tells us, you know, 160 bit plus minus a correction factor, and we need it, you know, down to the little last bit. We need the exact number. And this is unfortunately hard to do. Um, finding number of points exactly is computationally difficult and I'm not going to talk about that how we do that I mean this is mm, pretty advanced number theory how to find the number of points if you get really frustrated oh you know as soon as we want to use it Professor Parr doesn't tell us tell, doesn't tell us the whole truth um, this is so hard it's not that so hard and there's, there's libraries out there that compute that um, but very often in practice, because this is hard, people use standardized elliptic curves. There are standards out there. There's, there's, a, there's a very popular standard by the um, American standardization body, NIST, which many people use. We call, about, we call them the NIST curve, N-I. National Institute for Standard Technology, I think is the abbreviation. So they're called the NIST curves. They are about, I don't know, 14 curves or something, okay? There's also the German BSI, the BSE also proposed curves. They're secure and those, for these curves you, you, you have the number of points on the website. I, I think even there's a Wikipedia entrance, Wikipedia, in English Wikipedia. For the NIST curves, and you find the curves, that means you find the coefficient A and B, where is that somewhere here? Do we have A and B? No. You have A, B, and P, so you have the three parameters. You have some other parameters that we haven't really introduced here. And you have the cardinality, okay? Because it's pretty hard and you use the standardized curves and then start building your... Um, from that. So, um, we have one more thing in order to, to finish this first chapter. Namely, we want to look a little bit uh, again at um, and this discrete logarithm problem. You know, on, on this lower definition there, namely, um, all elliptic curve protocols, such as Diffie-Hellman, which we're going to do in five minutes, rely on the hardness of the ECDLP. Again, What does this mean, rely on the hardness, beruhen auf der Schwierigkeit, means if you want to break that protocol, if you want to break Diffie-Hellman, if you want to break elliptic curve digital signatures, you have to solve this problem, and then hardness means 
hopefully that's a hard problem. Ho hopefully that's really difficult to compute. You know, with all supercomputers on planet Earth, this cannot be done, hopefully. Okay. And the question, how hard is that? And I just want to want to uh, talk a little bit about that. So the question is, you know, how hard, how difficult, wie aufwendig ist das? Ja. 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 Kurven. Da nee, gibt es nicht genug Tinte auf der Erde für. Das sind, das sind ja 260 Punkte. Das ist wirklich, da gibt es nicht genug Ato Tintenatome. Das geht nicht. So the, no, otherwise you could do a brute force attack. It's a good, good remark. No, no, he, he, he had a good question. He said, so with the standardized curves, is, is there everything given? Is the primitive element given? Yes, of course. Does this help us with attacks? That's maybe what you were thinking of. No, of course it doesn't help us. You know, you have a primitive element... What the standardized curves do, they essentially give you the curve. I mean, you never saw, see a drawing, obviously, but you essentially have the curve, you have the starting point, good luck, right? From there, whatever app, you know, you, you have this your new iTunes, your, your new app that you write with some security property, and you, you want to make money with, 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 with your, with your uh, um, app. Um, you, you take the curve, you know, you, you, I mean, you take this graph, you take the general, and The, from there you're on your own, you know, you, you choose a random D, you end up with your public key, you have your private key, you can build your crypto system from that. And the attacker, and that's kind of the interesting thing, the attacker doesn't have any advantage from knowing the curve ahead of time and the point here. You, you, you can't pre-compute all points. I mean, if you could do that, you would have a brute force attack. Okay. So, how hard is that? And we did talk about that a few weeks ago before... No, the I think two, two or three weeks ago when we talked about the discrete logarithm problem, we talked about the attacks and maybe that seemed a little bit abstract and maybe you get a little bit more feeling for that now. Namely, long story made short, the discrete logarithm problem is very, very hard. So this is good for us as a designer. You know, if you design crypto system, we, we, we're not the crypto analyst, we're not Oscar, we don't want to attack this, we want to build something secure. This is a very good situation here. If the elliptic curve you see is chosen carefully, that means you have to be careful with a lot of things. And this is why people use the standardized curves. They're, they're chosen carefully, so they checked all kind of mathematical properties. If elliptic curve, if the elliptic curve is chosen carefully, the best. known algorithm for computing the DLP or the EC DLP if you wish or DLP uh, requires Approximately, approximately square root of p steps. Okay. And this square root here, just to warn you, this square root has nothing to do with the square root in Hassel. I mean, it's the same number, but there's, there's no mathematical reason why they're, why they're the same, okay? So this comes, they pop out of what, whatever the best attacks are, which we actually, when we classified them three weeks ago or so, we called these the square root attacks for that reason, because they have the square root complexity. And it's a sheer coincidence that this is the square root also comes up in the, uh, in Hatz's theorem. Again, let's look at an example. If you consider an elliptic curve with, with a 160-bit prime, that means all arithmetic is done with 160-bit arithmetic. 
numbers, 160-bit numbers, um, then the best known attack, attack requires square root of p, which is square root of 160, You remember that, right? Ninth grade or so, all right? Steps. This is very hard. Actually, we... Um, Professor Gunezo showed you the Copacabana here, the first lecture, I said, right, in way, way back in October, right? Um, and actually his master thesis, his diploma by it, whatever, five years ago, of Professor Gunezo dealt um, with implementing these best-known attack for elliptic curves on, on Copacabana, okay? So what you can do with, you know, with the best-known, with this custom hardware, we think we can solve... 2 to the 35 or something, right? You can do 2 to the 35 operations in one year or something like that, right? And from there, we can approximate how long it will take to 2 to the 80. And it turns out with, with current hardware, it will be 1 million years or something, okay? With the hardware becoming faster and faster, with Moore's law, we can approximate rough estimate is 15 to 20 years, okay? For this, you know, for 2 to the 80, we can 2 to the 80... This type of hopping around, I mean, that, that, that was his, his, his master thesis, right? We can probably do, um, our assumption was 1 million euros. So we can, you know, we can go in, 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 in to Aldi, not Aldi, but you can go to a store and buy computer hardware for 1 million euros. And that in, if you do that, not today, but if you wait 20 years, and you buy computers for 1 million euros, you can do 2 to the 80 group operations and this baby is broken. Okay, and this is why 160 people say, well, you have a security for 15, 20 years, something like that. This is kind of the lower, lower threshold what people want to use. And actually, most commercial products now, they switch to 192, 256. These are two other popular numbers. Okay. Whew. Schwere Geburt. So, we're done with the first chapter of today. Okay. So comes, now, comes if, now comes kind of a fun part. And what's a little bit of shame here is actually about this part of the lecture. I think what, what, what is really good, hopefully, that we generalize the discrete ro logarithm problem to elliptic curves, as what I said before, you know, in, in, in terms of, of deeper understanding, maybe also erkenntnis given, maybe that helps you. What's a little bit of shame is that there's a lot of mathematics that are really deep, pretty advanced, so there's no, you know, we, we, we can't really, we don't really want to talk about where has the theorem stems from, we don't really want to introduce a discrete logarithm problem, attacks, so a lot of things where it just gives you facts, right? einfach Fakten wissen, right, these are, just give it to you, which is a little bit frustrating for me as a teacher sometimes. So now the second part will be different, we look at elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, and this is much more algorithms, and we do real crypto, so it's kind of a nice mixture, hopefully, of in, in today's lecture. So the second part of today deals with elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, key exchange. which is sometimes, not always, but sometimes abbreviated as uh, ECDH, ECDH, if elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Okay? So now it becomes, uh, ho hopefully you start appreciating this beauty of discrete logarithm problems because all the discrete logarithm uh, protocols look very much the same. Once, once you give me a new cyclic group, and we have a new cyclic group, namely... 
elliptic curves here, you can just go back to the stuff we did actually before, before the, uh, uh, the vacation, before, uh, in, in February, look at the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and they do exactly the same protocol, exactly the same, just with elliptic curves. So once you have a new group, we immediately have all the crypto applications. We immediately have, have the key exchange. Later on, we will have automatically digital signature. We have encryption schemes. El Gamal, El Gamal encryption, you can also do with elliptic curves. It's a little bit tricky, but it's essentially the same. So this is straightforward. Straightforward is one word, by the way. This is very popular mistakes for in the bachelor thesis. Straightforward adoption. Of Diffie Hellman in ZP. Okay, this is in ZP this is the Diffie Hellman with integers that we've done again in February and, and actually used a few times so far. Okay. So, um, for the protocol, we have, as always, we have two phases. We have the setup phase, where we need, the, uh, where we need domain parameters. And the so domain parameters in, um, with the plain LTV element were very easy. They were just a prime P and a primitive element, and it's the same here, but we don't have a prime anymore. Well, we, we, we have a prime, but the pri we, we need the algebraic structure. We need the cyclic group. In that P stuff we did in February, the algebraic structure is given by P, right? If I give you a prime, you immediately know what the P is, right? If I give you, if the prime is 31, well, the algebraic structure is Z31. But now, the algebraic structure is this baby here. So we need an elliptic curve. E, I'm sorry, this is E. Again, which is given by the curve equation, obviously. Okay. And we need a primitive element. So then we have to run the protocol, okay? First phase, second phase. This is the uh, protocol, the actual protocol. How does this work? How much Platz brauche ich denn here? Let's try to squeeze it in here, okay? No, let's not try to do that. Uh, second phase is here. So if just continue underneath here, right? If you if you're copying this. Um, so we have our parties, Alice and Bob, and Alice and so here's the, here, here's the story. Alice and Bob have AS, really fast AS implementation. AS is really secure, people cannot break that. And they do some, I don't know, illegal downloaded videos, right? So they just got this new Hollywood hit and they want to send it over the network and they don't, and they want to encrypt that. They want to use AS with 128 bit key. So they need to agree on a key and, you know, Alice lives in Bochum and Bob lives in Munich and they don't want to, you know, travel down by, you know, with a Bahncard 50 or something, right? It's really expensive and, and hard. So they want to exchange a key over an unsecured channel. So Alice and Bob took my class so they know how to do that. So the first thing is they agree on an elliptic curve and they probably, they might, use one of the standardized curves, right, that exist. What Alice then does is she has to set up a discrete logarithm problem. What is a discrete logarithm problem? 
is this here, right? Alice, and Alice has to do the, this kind of thing here. Okay, so the first thing she needs is the um, private key, which we denote by lowercase. So this is k private of Alice, which is lowercase a, k private of Alice. Where do we get? Where do we typically get a private key from? How do how do we generate a private key? Very broad question. Random, right? Zufallszahl. You don't want to do anything kind of computation that maybe Oscar can compute. You know, and, and, and the more random, the better. Okay. So some kind of random number. And so often you don't want to use the, the, if you use the full cardinality here, cardinality of E, if this would be A, A would end up be the neutral element, which is something you don't really want to do. Bob does the same. Bob computes his private key. Okay. So now we have the private key, which we, which we called D here, right? Now you have to compute your public key, which is called the T value here, which we call uppercase A and uppercase B. Also, yeah? Wasn't there some restriction that um, P is greater than 3, I think? That P, P größer 3 is? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, but this is not related to this P here. Das, das, das kommt ja nur aus der Gruppe raus. Also das 2 würde ja einfach heißen. Das hier. Das wird ihre Verschlüsselung sozusagen. Das ist eine gute Bemerkung. Also das... Die 2 hier, die hat nichts mit diesem P zu tun hier. Also das ist ja, wie gesagt, das ist ja nur, wie oft wir rumspringen. Ne? Das hat nichts damit zu tun, dass, die, ähm, dass wir nicht die Primzahl 2 nehmen. P ist, P ist in der Praxis gigantisch. Also P ist zum Beispiel eine 160-Bit-Primzahl hier. A könnte man klein wählen, das wär, aber der muss zufällig gewählt werden. Also die Wahrscheinlichkeit ist ziemlich klein, dass wir da jetzt 2, 3 oder irgendwie sowas haben. Aber prinzipiell vom Protokoll ist gute Bemerkung. Ähm, können Sie haben es. So, he was worried that Can we choose two? Is that a problem? Because in the definition of elliptic curve from last week, you, you really paid attention. Is it says p can't be two, at, but in, in theory, at least you, you, you could choose two here, and everything would be fine if you Hellman wise. So this will become our public key. What do we do? Well, you do a point, or it's called a point multiplication. So you take private key times primitive element. And again, what kind of baby is that? What kind of data structure do we get out here, public key? Is that an integer or point of the curve? Point of the curve. Okay, so this is... This is what I told you before. Where was that? Think... told you. Write that down. You know what I'm talking about? Links oberste Tafel. Sehr gut. <laughs> Thank you. 
Private key is an integer, public key is a point on the curve. Very good. Okay. And this is exactly what's happening. You know, this is a boring integer. You know, this is 918,711. You know, it's a, some, some num integer number. This is a point on the curve. Same here. And again, this I exactly exact analogy what, what you do with uh, uh, over ZP. Now you exchange your public keys. They're, they're public. You know, they're, you can't, don't have to keep them secret. You can send them over the channel. So what Alice does in order to compute the session key, she computes. She takes her secret, her private key, and multiplies that with the public key she receives. And this becomes, you know, as a, as she gets one result out. And Bob does the same. Bob takes his secret, you know, his private key, multiplies that with the public key of Alice, and surprise, surprise, He computes the same point, okay? So that's Diffie Hellman, just to motivate it, to motivate it a little bit more. To what we can do at this point is, if we want to actually do encryption here, what we can do now, let's say we have a message M. This is your illegally downloaded video file, right? One gigabyte. Okay, you want to encrypt. So, um, so your AS encrypt M, which is not the hard part, that's the easy part. The hard part is which key are we using? You can use either the X or the Y coordinate. And actually, in, in practice, you know, th usually that's too long. For instance, X would be a 160-bit number. AES only needs 128 bits. So what you do, you just take the 128 leading bits. You know, and you drop the other 32 bits. No, the Führenden or the of the anderen Seite or some. You know, you take you have 160 bit. You, you you take you take you have 160 bits here. You you choose 128 bit. And in practice, it's even a little bit more complicated. Typically, it's recommended to hash that, but I don't want to go into that. So for you, just choose any 128 bits, and we just write that this way, right? We pretend X, A, B is, you know, is 128 bit. You get your ciphertext out, which we call C. At this, usually, we call the ciphertext Y, but then you get confused with the X and Y coordinates. Um, you send the ciphertext over the channel, and uh, if Alice receives the ciphertext, she wants to watch the movie, right, that you downloaded. So she has to AES decrypt, run AES in decryption mode. And here's now the beauty. She has the same key, right? You share the same key. Grau is other theory, right? All theory is gray. So let's look at an example. Oops, okay. I don't even have a keyboard here, so okay. Is this readable? Can you read that a little, the protocol? Is that lesbar? Hinten a billige Plätze, yeah, geht das gut, sehr gut. So, um, so just to show you here, you know, this is, is, is uh, 
Example 9.8, 9, 9, page 251. You know, it's one of the toy examples that we like. Surprise, surprise, we have the same elliptic curve we've been using the whole time here, right? So we use this elliptic curve. Again, surprise, we use the same primitive element we had before, and now we show how to do an, you know, toy size Spielzeug Diffie-Hellmann. Um, here, Alice chooses three as a public key, a private key, sorry, and Bob chooses ten. Alice, you know, computes three point, three point P, which you can look back in the table, all right? This, this is what happens. So you, three point P is this here. Bob computes his B, his, his public key, which, you know, is 10 times P. And again, you look in the table, you'll find 10 times P is this, this point. They exchange the stuff. And then here, you, yeah, it, you, you have to do a group operation. So you do, you know, three times B plus B plus B. You do three times the group operation you end up with this point with the coordinate 13 times 10. And here's kind of the, the nice surprising thing. Here we're computing B times, so that means 10 times the other public key. So 10 times this here, 10 times this here. And it turns out, da da da, they compute the same point. Okay? And now, you know, coming back to our example, you see there you have the same X and Y coordinates. It means you could use the number 13 as AES input. Of course, this is only like a four or five bit number. You don't want to do that with four, with, with, with small numbers. But if you do that with really large numbers, it works just the same. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that. Namely, um, let's look whether this, this really always works, the proof of correctness. And again, this is very easy. This is, is very much uh, uh, analogous to um, plain old Diffie-Hellman. Alice computes A times B. And B was the public key of Bob. Where, 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 where was this coming from? You see it over there. Uppercase B was lowercase b times p. Which is this due to the associativity. This associative gesetz gilt here because it's a group. Um, what does Bob compute? Well, Bob takes his public key, his private key, and, and, mul and, and, and multiplies that with the uppercase A here, with the public key of Alice. Danke. You get the same result. Again, associative gesetz here. Okay. C'est ça. Das war's. Okay. So... Towards the end of the lecture, there's one thing which is, uh, uh, again, which is not complicated and which I think is kind of nice too. You want to talk a little bit about computational aspects. How do we implement that? So let's look at the actual computations that Alice and Bob have to do, the kind of operations they have to do. Well, obviously, they have to do the group operation, right? They have to hop around on the curve, and this is what we did last week, this is what you do for your homework, right? You can add points. And we have, remember that, there's group a, a point addition and point doubling? Okay. This is one thing, so we know how to do that. But this is now a little bit more complicated. You have to what's called point multiplication or scalar multiplication, which is something we haven't discussed, really. You do A times P, and here do A times B. Bob does the same. So and this is what, what we do towards the end of the lecture, and this is kind of something that is not really new, but it's, it's kind of nice. Um, of 
question is, how to compute You know, essentially, the, the orange dots, how do we do the orange dots that you see there? Okay. And let's say in general terms, let's call that A times P. The problem is, and I think I talked about it. If not, I'll do that now. There's no natural, natural way, direct way of doing A times P. Okay. That's, it, it looks like, well, you do multiplication. There is no such thing as multipli you're multiplying scalar by, 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 by points. This is just the same as doing, and I think I talked about it last time, right? Doing, I don't know, 37 times, okay? They ask you to do that. Nobody thinks, oh, there's some, you know, some arithmetic operation that does that. We all know, maybe this is, I'll do a smaller, to the fifth. You'll see why, because it, you look at that and you immediately see, okay, this is 37 times 37 times 37 times 37 times 37, right? That means this is just a notation, shorthand notation, right? Convenient notation. Same goes here. Okay, so this is just a shorthand notation for P plus P plus P plus A times. Okay, so what's the same? But here, if we have really large numbers, how do we do that? Square and multiply, okay? And here's the beautiful thing the square and multiply works exactly the same for elliptic curves. But instead of squaring, you know, squaring is, okay, in elliptic curve, squaring becomes P plus P, so this is doubling, okay, squaring becomes doubling, multiply was, you know, A times, I don't know, X, this is multiply, in elliptic curve, this becomes Add. So square and multiply becomes double and add. So it's a double and add algorithm. Okay. The point multiplication A times P can be computed with the nochmal quotation marks with the double and add algorithm. I give you an example. Okay. So let's say we want to compute 26 times p. And remember when I introduced the double, uh, the square and multiply, I said, well, there's a dumb way of doing it and the smart way of doing it. The dumb way would be to do p plus p plus p plus p plus p 25, 25 times. Okay, 25 times the group operation. It turns out there's a better way. And again, the double and add and square and multiply are identical algorithms. You just replace the operations. And what we did with the square and multiply, we looked at the binary representation as dual zahl, as binär zahl, of the exponent. But now the exponent is this multiplier here. So we, we have to look at 26 in, in binaries. Turns out to be the number one one zero one zero times p. Okay, here's the algorithm, and I just give you this one example, and then you look the algorithm up in the um, book. And again, we, we derived that more formally before. So let's here 
we take care of the iteration number of the steps. We start with step zero. What we do in, do in step zero, we do, we compute, you know, P, which is obviously equal to one times P. Okay, so we don't do anything here. Okay, now the algorithm starts. And an uh, alternative name, actually, for the, for the square and multiply and double and add is left to right method because we scan the exponent coming from the left. So, and we, we're done with this one is fine here. This one is this one. Now we have to look at the next one here. So what we do, step 1a, you double. Okay, so you do... P plus P is 2P. Which is this binary representation, which is one double here. Okay. Now you look at the second bit here. Second bit, you know, coming from the left. It says a one or a zero. Well, this is a one, right? Unfortunately, right now we have a zero here, so we have to turn this zero into a one. And any ideas how do we do that? At, and we add P. This one, this is 2p plus p is 3p, and it's 1, 1. Okay. Can get your stabilos ready, okay. We need a lot of colors here. Um, so, um, so we're done with the second bit. Now let's look at the third bit. This is iteration 2a, first part of the second iteration. We do, again, double. We always double. So we have 3p plus 3p is a doubling operation. Gives us 6p. Or in binary, 1, 1, 0. So the, the bit we just generated was a zero at the third position. It's a zero here. That means we're done in this operation, in this iteration. And at this point, we're already done with the... Uh. Okay, let's go to bit number four. Again, the, this is, we, that means we go to the next iteration, to iteration number three or step number three. Again, we double. 6p plus 6p equals 12p. 12 has a binary representation of 1100. Zero, zero. Okay. Again, what you always generate in the, uh, in, in the scalar here is a zero. Okay, we just generate the zero here. We're talking about this bit here, right? Bit number four coming from the left. Well, this is a one, so we, again, we have, to, we have to flip that. We have to turn the zero into one by adding, by adding P. So that's iteration number 3B. This is 12P plus P becomes 13P, which is 1, 1, 0, 1 times P, which is exactly what we want to have. So the pattern looks pretty good. And now we have to do the last bit, bit number four, number five, depending how you count. Iteration 4a, we do um, 13p, we double again. We get 26, which is our seal number which is exactly what we want to have, and I, I'm out of colors. I don't know what to do, so I can... Yeah, okay, so, okay. And again, to show you what's happening here is, so, in, you know, in every iteration we doubled in the beginning, we need one more minute here. So it's the same rule as before. Eine Minute noch, eine Minute. 
Hallo, da oben. Ja, ja. Sehr gut. So we always double. If the bit that we are processing happens to be a one, we not only double, but we also add. So you know the orange bit, so to speak, this was a one, that's why we also added. The green, in the green case here, we, there was no one, so we didn't have to add. In this reddish, red-purple one, we again had to add. Okay, so it's the same algorithm, same complexity. Um, you find the full algorithm in the book, I just wanted to... Here, this is the whole, that's the algorithm on page 248 here. Klasse Vorlesung, vielen Dank.